When I said earlier that about coming to Unity and finding a place where you learn something, I, re I, was, that was, really attract I was really attracted to the idea. A and so in Unity, we, what I'm doing right now, or I'm going to do, <laughs> we don't call a sermon because I, I don't think you need to be preached to. We call it a lesson because we need to learn. And through learning, we transform how we see things. And that's what we're in need of, not salvation, but of transformation. When I first found Unity, my initial impression was that I had come to a place where there were people who were genuinely seeking answers to spiritual questions. People who, like me, wanted to challenge the status quo, not afraid to. People with open minds and open hearts. Coming from, coming from a philosophy background, and the fact that I had been reading about spirituality since the 1970s, that just opened the door for me to just really come on and, and, and try to find out everything I could about this newfound approach to spirituality that we call unity. And then when I saw the newsletter that first week that there was a class on metaphysics, that clinched the deal for me. I signed up immediately. It wasn't for credit because I didn't know about taking classes for credit. I just wanted to learn more. Very soon thereafter, I did start taking classes for credit. And that led me to becoming the spiritual leader at Unity Rio Grande Valley and in a journey to become a licensed Unity teacher. That sent me even further to become an ordained minister. It was a slow process. I was working full time. It took me 10 years to do all that. One of the first things that I learned coming into U Unity was that Unity had its origin in Christianity, and me coming from the Catholic background, I was like, really? You all consider yourself Christian? This is, this is no version of Christianity I've ever heard of, but let's hear some more, you know? That stirred my interest, and it still does to this day, about wanting to learn everything I could, in particular, about the early Christian movement. Because growing up a Catholic, the only thing I knew was what they had told me. And the first thing I learned from this new angle, from this new approach, that was the difference between what is called the devotional approach to studying the Bible versus the historical critical approach to studying the Bible. Tradition uses the devotional approach in which the Bible is the literal inerrant word of God. You're not there to question it. You're there to understand what is God saying to his people. Intuitively, that just never really made sense to me. I, I, I was never comfortable with that idea. And so I, I wanted to find a place where I could search for unbiased answers as much as that is possible. So I turned to the Christian scholars, and not just any Christian scholars, but the best ones in the world. I turned to the great courses. I took like 12 courses on Christianity and in particular, the early movement. Today's lesson is based on one of those courses. It is called, How Jesus Became God. Interesting title, don't you think? How Jesus Became God. Right away, what does that title tell you? It says that there was a time when Jesus was not seen as God. In fact, now get this, the author of that course suggests that the idea that Jesus is or was God would be foreign to Jesus. That's a strange comment to make. Why? Because he did not think of him, himself that way in the earlier Gospels. That designation came later on, much later on. So the question is how, why? And of course, that's the subject of today's lesson. Biblical scholar Marcus Borg refers to this distinction as the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus. Easter changed everything. A whole nother story. Another way to describe this difference is about the historical Jesus versus the Christ of faith. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, Christ of faith, but that's the traditional approach of how you see Jesus. Three points about this comment about Jesus not considering himself to be God during his lifetime. His own very words, again, in the early Gospels. 
And the fact that the Gospels are not eyewitness accounts, they're all based on oral tradition that developed over time, over decades. Someone heard a story and they would tell someone else. That person would in turn, in turn tell the, another person and then that person would tell someone else. This went on for about 40 years until it was finally written down. And when it was written down, it was written down in a different language, in Greek. So that further clouded the stories because of translation issues. A couple of few weeks ago, I told you about that when I was etching glass and somebody came in and wanted to have a nameplate for his son-in-law who was going to take over the business. And you know, he, he, he said, I want el queso grande, the big cheese, put on it. And I go, um, okay, literally, yeah, the big cheese, that's el queso grande. But <laughs> figuratively, connotatively, that is not what it means. <laughs> and so, so I, I just, I, rem I remember that because scholars cite many such examples of translation errors. One more thing, we don't have any original manuscripts, none, zero. There were copies of copies of copies that we have. The, the furthest back that we can go with the manuscripts we have are probably date to like middle of the first century or so. And we did not have copying machines, no Xerox machines. All done hand by hand by scribes. And who knows how much the scribes really knew. Most people did not know how to read. Some of the scribes even didn't know how to read, but, but they were good at copying symbols. And that's really all you gotta do. But what happens when, when you come across, you know, imagine two guys sitting there translating and when one guy comes across a letter, a word that he does not know, and the word is celebrate, and he tells the other guy, hey, um, what's this word? Is that, is that spelled right? And the other guy says, uh, no, just take out the R. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> so ce <laughs> celebrate becomes celibate. <laughs> and now we have a different meaning. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so the question then becomes, how close to the original story is the story that was ultimately written down? That's the question. The author suggests a simple way to decide this is that the further you get away from the event, the more it is subject to, in, uh, to interpretation, to inaccuracy for the reasons that we just cited. So now the question then is, what is the chronological order of the gospels in which they were written? Do we know that? Yes, we do. And they go something like this. Mark, even though Matthew starts in the Bible, Matthew is the first one, it, 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 that's not the first one written. Mark was the first one written. And that was the year between 60 and 70 CE, more or less. Matthew and Luke were written about 10 years later, between the 70s and, and the 80s somewhere. And John was the last one to have been written. It was written somewhere around 95, maybe even a little bit later than that. 35 years after Mark, 65 years after Jesus. That's a long time. So keep that sequence in mind because it is important and I will come back to it in a minute. Finally, to understand the process that took place, it is imperative that we change our lens. We are, you've heard me say that we are all looking at the world through a lens. And we cannot use the 21st century lens to look at that time space, that time period. We need to change our lens to a first century lens to try to even get an idea. Because see, it is, what did they see? How did they see the world? How did they see their understanding of the God, the universe, mankind, and the relationship of all these things? Because they are in the past events, we can get a pretty good idea. To begin with, generally speaking, all the people, including the authors of those books, were living in the tribal stage of our spiritual unfolding. We talked about this before when, we did, when I did the lesson about integral Christianity. And we've talked about it a little bit at, at the Let's Get Metaphysical group when we talk about spiral dynamics. So as a reminder of the characteristics of the tribal stage, these are some of them. It is very strongly based in uh, myth mythology and magic, and magic, very strong. The, the book from, from inter, inter, Integral Christianity comes this. Historically, tribal cultures have not yet differentiated mind and body. They confuse symbols with the reality they symbolize. Remember the, the moon and the finger pointing at the moon, things like that? One's church or group is uniquely the depository of divine truth. 
I got the truth. God is fear-based, and God is separate from us. And Jesus offered himself as a sacrificial offering to appease God's wrath, and so on. We recognize all these because we've been through them. I've been through with the Catholic Church. That's pretty much what the message is. Now, the interesting thing about the beliefs of the tribal mentality is that they had this understanding of God becoming men, gods becoming men, and men becoming gods. So that's how they understood things to be going on at the same times. So that's the lens that you have to try to put yourself in to visualize how Jesus became God. There's one more note, and it's really, really big. And they were mostly pagans in that time. And so they believed in God, many gods, the God of war, the God of love, the God of this, that, and the other. So looking through that lens, the idea of many gods involving, involved in human affairs and the idea of them having access to this up and down elevator where they can go up and down different stages of existence was a very common thing for them. This is how they saw things. Now, the, the, the book says there's three ways that gods can move up and down this ladder. One of them is that a god will decide to take on a form of a, of a human for whatever particular reason that God decides to do it. The second one is that it can be a result of a mixture of an interaction between a god and, and a human being. That happens all the time. Hercules was half man, half mortal, half mortal, half immortal. Number three is a powerful person can be raised and divinized after their deaths. They did that a lot to the emperors, to great people who had power, Alexander. You know, they made them gods after they had, been, they had died. They elevated them up. So this was very all not unusual in the mindset of these people at that time. So it's hard to understand that. But, and the, the interesting thing about this three-step things or three ways things, is that Jesus, you could apply all three to Jesus. Because once he was, he was uh, ultimately declared God, then as God, he took the form of a human, that's the classic story, in order to, uh, for the sins of the world, we are told. And the second way that he satisfied that as well is that in, he was the product of the interaction of a spirit and a woman. And the third, was that he was divinized after his death, raised from the dead, and ascended. All fascinating stuff, really is. But here's the clincher. There was nothing, and this is a strange idea. Again, when you have an open mind and, a, and an open heart and you listen to these things, you learn a lot of stuff, really, but there was nothing, here's a, an odd thing. There was nothing truly unique about Jesus. That is a strange comment to make. But not really. Not the virgin birth, not the miracles, not the resurrection, not the ascension, nothing. There were many other such similar stories. And they go way back. Here's an example. 3,000 years BC, there's a guy in Egypt called Horus, born of a virgin, Isis, born on December 25th, star in the east, adored by three kings, prodigal teacher at 12, baptized at 30, had 12 disciples and traveled throughout the world, performed miracles, including healing, walking on water. He was known as the truth, the light, the Lamb of God, the good shepherd, etc. Crucified, buried for three days, and resurrected. That's the story of Horace, 3,000 years ago. <laughs> During the time of Jesus, there were others. There was one in particular that this one course of the great courses talks about. His name was Apollonius of Tiana. Same thing. He had 12 disciples. He healed. He traveled. The, all of these things. Identical. Now, have you ever wondered why these events don't happen anymore? There are no more. I don't know of any virgin births in the last 2,000 whatever plus years. <laughs> no resurrections, no ascensions, no walking on water, nothing. And yet, they were commonplace back then. And not only with Jesus, but as I said, as others as well. Now the question is, almost like that, uh, my cousin Busy, uh, Vinny, do the laws of physics cease to exist in your kitchen? <laughs> I don't know if you remember that line, but it's, it's hilarious. So did these things cease to happen? 
or they or they were what happened is that they were the beliefs of the tribal mind and we ultimately outgrew it truth is miracles still happen they do but not in the same sense not in the magical way they happen now because of our understanding of things that, uh, that, that we're beginning to understand that we are powerful co-creators of the universe and so we can alter things and the more we learn this the better and the more we practice it the better we're going to get at performing what would be called a miracle i still have hope of, of, of levitating in my lifetime <laughs> and, and last week when we did the let's get metaphysical on saint thomas i did not know that about saint thomas aquinas he was reportedly able to levitate i said way to go thomas <laughs> show me the way my brother <laughs> When I came to Unity Georgetown, <clears throat> the process of being fascinated with Unity started all over again. But this time, I found even more people with the same attitude or mindset that I have in this it, it, it just ceaseless wanting to learn more and more. Anne Kennedy is one of them. And, 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 but but there's many of you. They all are. And in fact, this week we had a class with uh, Anne Kennedy about the Gnostics. And there was about 20 of us there or something. Very fascinating discussions. And I didn't plan today's lesson because of that class, but it worked out that way. Then Merritt, he, she said, she's one of our new members, hi Merritt, <laughs> brought me a New York Times article that is exactly contrary to everything I am talking about today. <laughs> yeah, I gotta love it. Not, now you talk about timing, I love it. The article, is called The Benefits of a Naive Reading of the Gospels. <clears throat> and so, I'm going to send that out to my Let's Get Metaphysical group because we need to talk about this. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about it and whoever else wants it as well because that's very interesting. Then on top of that, this week, I had told my wife about the Q Gospel. I don't, are any, who's familiar with the Q Gospel? Anybody? Okay, a few are. Uh, so I need to, um, We'll talk about that some more soon. But she ordered this, the lost gospel cue. So all this stuff is just coming together and clearly this conversation is not over. We are learning. That's what I love about unity. You will never go to a traditional church and have an open discussion on the topic of the gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Mary Magdalene. They won't even bring up their names. And why not? Is it because there's no truth to be found in them? No, it's because it doesn't fit in their formula. And so we're not going to even talk about it. God forbid we would take, you know, change. We don't want to do that. That's for sure. And Anne said one thing, you know, all, all, she said, all, all books contain, none of the books contain all the truth with a capital T. They all probably... All wisdom books more than likely probably all contain some of the truth, but they also inc include some fallacy. And why is that? Because we are pro they are all ultimately the product of human beings. Yes, they could have been divinely inspired, but nonetheless, they need to go through that filter of that human. And albeit some filters are less limiting than others, nevertheless, they are filters. And the filter, it's whatever stage of consciousness the person is in. Another thing I like about unity, or at least what I understand to be my version of unity, is that whether an actual event happened or not is not a deal breaker. By this, I mean that there is a spiritual message, a concept behind every story, and the concept is much bigger than the actual event, whether it happened this way or happened that way or what they were wearing or whatever else was going on. It does, that's not the point of the lesson. And that's what the premise is about, about today's lesson. So I want to spend a little time, what's remaining time, to talk about the, the timeline that I brought up earlier about the Gospels, how they evolved as time went on, how Jesus became God. Now, this is very fascinating, really, really fascinating stuff for me. One of the things you have to understand, too, about the mindset of the time is that humans tend to exaggerate things and change the stories. As, remember, it was all verbal, I mean, all oral tradition for a long time. So it's the classic fisherman story, right? The guy caught a 10-pound bass, and, and before you know it, it's a 1,000-pound whale. It's classic. 
And then when I first started coming to Unity, I also learned about Rocco Erico and, and George Lamsa, which we've talked about. And they're very big into the translation of the Aramaic and, and all these other things. And I remember them saying that in particular, the people of the Middle East love to exaggerate, make the story as big as it can. You know, somebody tells you something like, wow, you tell somebody else, it's like, you got bigger. It's the classic thing. So let's recall the, the, the chronological order of the, of the Gospels. First, there was Mark, about 65, let's say rounded out 65 CE. Then Luke and Matthew, 75-ish. And finally, John, about 95 or so. So who is Jesus in each of these Gospels? This, I found this fascinating when I went through this course. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is a full-grown man when it starts. He's already in the will. He's out, you know, preaching. He's an apocalyptic preacher, and he's talking about the kingdom of God that is coming and a new world order and that is coming before their lifetime. Because he tells some of them, you will not see that before you die. You're going to see. He believed that the new kingdom was going to happen very, very soon. And he makes no reference to being the son of God. But when, he's, but when he's, he is baptized, then it says in Mark 1.11, And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love, and with whom I am well pleased. Two things about this here. Jesus is noted as God's son. Not, when, not as a full-grown man, but after he is baptized. And the second is that there is this distinction of the God, the son, the father, and the son. He says, you are my son. Interesting. The next two Gospels, in Matthew and Luke, were written about 10 years later. And now what happens? What kind of a story do we find about Jesus? Well, the famous Christmas stories that we know of. Because now Jesus becomes God, not when he's a full-grown man, but at birth. It's changing. And this is what it says. The angel, and in Luke, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born and be called the Son of God. The classic interaction of, of a spirit and a, and a person. So in Mark and Luke, he's declared the Son of God, not at baptism again, but at, as a full-grown man, but at birth as a newborn. The timeline has changed when he became God. So... Recall that the first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. We talked about that. And the Synoptics, because they're similar. You can do a, syn a synopsis on them, let's say. At the same time, though, there is something else called the Synoptic Problem. And the Synoptic Problem is that there are irreconcilable inconsistencies within the stories of the different Gospels. So this moves us up to the Gospel of John. Now we're pushing you know, the year 100 or so, and we have moved from that 10-pound bass to the 1,000-pound whale. <laughs> the Gospel of John is not even remotely similar to the other Gospels. Jesus is not God's son at baptism or God's son at birth. Jesus in the Gospel of John is God's son before time began. <laughs> wow. No, no, I mean, this is, this is how it is. And, and, and in fact, he's not even God's son. He is God. Because it says, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am. Wow. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is portrayed as what is called the cosmic Christ that existed before time began as God. Now, that's a transition. And these are, and the, when I first heard it, I said, wow, this is an amazing declaration for Jesus to make. And, and this, what could be more important if that's truly the message? Why did he wait? Why did he not talk this way in Mark, Matthew, and Luke? This is a big deal. This is like your, your main deal. Why, why not tell us early on in, in, in your ministry? And the only answer that scholars can come up with is that, he didn't think, see himself that way in the early years. That's something that developed through the tradition later on. Why does all this matter? In a, in a way, it really doesn't matter. It's strange. What matters is the spiritual, spiritual message 
that all of this is saying to us. That's what matters, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And the stories and the events of the Bible are just a wisdom book that are ex examples of the many experiences, experiences that we go through. So for us in unity, we do not get bogged down in the details of stories. We keep ourselves focused on the bigger picture of who we truly, truly are. Here's the point to all this. Jesus didn't become God. He was God. And you don't become gods. You are gods. We have to think bigger. And these are not my words. These are the words in Psalms. You are all gods and children of the Most High. And so it is.